those who we know of that are close to us or struggling with health and other difficulties tonight. Bless them in their healing, their treatment, uh, their strength in every way, that uh, it might be just as good as possible for all of those as it is according to your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. you've been here the last two weeks, we don't need a whole lot of introduction, but for those you might not have, we'll say just a couple of quick things. We've been talking about, for this will be our third week, the wrong sacrifice. It grows out of a statement that Brother John Ferguson shared with us three weeks ago, or no, it's been four weeks now because this is our third week on this, of how some children might actually think that instead of everybody in the family sacrificing on behalf of the Lord as their, you know, as a Christian mother, Christian father, Christian children, that they themselves have felt uh, somewhat like the sacrifice. They're the ones who are sacrificed. And certainly we do not want that to happen. We want to do everything that's possible that that might not happen. So as we think about that wrong sacrifice, We're reminded of what Paul said both in Ephesians 6 and Colossians 3. Uh, Two different words here, but with basically the same application of the same meaning. We do not want to stir our children up in a way that is negative, but rather to bring them up in the way that the Lord would have us to train and admonish them. We notice that uh, anger is a powerful and passionate emotion. Uh, the, uh, don't have, I don't think I have the quote up here, but W.E. Vine, Vine's Expository Dictionary said the Greeks considered it the most passionate of all emotions, anger. When it gets out of control, it does a great deal of damage. This quote from the five light, light, love languages of children, uh, primary lifetime threat to your child is his or her own anger. Your child does not handle, handle his own anger well, it will damage or destroy him. <clears throat> the mishandling of anger is related to every present and future problem your child may have, from poor grace to damaged relationships to possible suicide. It is imperative that you do all you can to safeguard your child now and in the future. And of course, that goes very much hand in hand with what Paul said in those two verses in Ephesians Colossians that we looked at. So tonight we're going to look at a few more. I'm hoping that we get done, but if we don't, that's, uh, you know, not the end of the world. It's not even the end of the year yet, so we'll be all right. We'll get to them. But uh, at the rate we've been going, we probably won't get through all of them tonight if we have a good discussion again as, as we have had. Okay, uh, a way that we do we want to be sure that we do not cause uh, our children to be provoked, not making time to talk. All of us recognize that whatever good things we may do as God's children, with a parent, child, whatever relationship we're talking about, or in just living the Christian life, time does not knock at the door and say, hey, you can use me. This would be a good time for something to happen. Just wanted to remind you of that. We have to make time to make time. We have to think about it in a very, uh, a very conscious way Here's how I'm going to make some time to talk to my children. Because if we do not do that, today, <clears throat> even more so than perhaps a couple of generations ago, the world is beating at our door, demanding time for various other things. And it has to be a conscious decision that we will make time for talking. Remember what James says. We've talked about this both in this class and also in our Sunday morning lesson when we talked about this part of the book of James. We focus here particularly on let every man be swift to hear. And this most especially is causing us to think about our children, making time to hear them, pushing out the time pressures of the world and spending time with them, not necessarily and not just in co-activities, for instance, If we were, uh, you know, all watching television together, well, that's great that we're all in the same room, but that probably doesn't allow for much talking, much communicating between parent and child, unless what we're watching prompts that, and we plan, and we say, hey, 
You know, that, that brings up a point there. Let's talk about that. But most of the time, that sort of time together is not fruitful as far as just talking to one another, communicating. But we can do things like uh, family nights in which we do have time to be together. We can have something that a lot of folks are, are calling for, suggesting these days, and that is uh, an electronics-free day together or perhaps night together with parents and children. Um, it seems to be pretty popular these days to make commercials that make light of this situation in which people get together, but everybody has an electronic device in front of them, so they're only together physically. They're not together mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually. They're not talking about things that parents and children need to be talking about. So maybe a night just devoted to family time or maybe just a night uh, devoted to being in the same house, but we're not going to use our, our e-devices at all. An e-free day, just like the commercial where grandma and grandpa is using the, using the wand, you know, to check their, their kids and their grandkids for devices and, and putting them in just like, just like you would at, a, at the TSA at the airport, you know. They got the bucket there and they put all of them in it. Sometimes it's just not time for, you know, for, there's some places that you don't need electronic devices. Something like that is the same. Bart? Yes, it works that way too. Yeah, and the parents say some pretty ridiculous things too, don't they? Yeah. Talk about something she accomplished and, 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 and one of the parents says, get some pictures of that. <laughs> it's like... Come on. So uh, that's the way the world, you know, these, these, these commercials, these, these things that we see on television, they make fun of what's really happening. And uh, we know probably from experience, from things we see, that that's happening too much. So here's a way to provoke our children, not making time for them to talk. And even if they have that, that, that cell phone or that, do they still have iPods or they call something else now? They used to be iPods, but they still have things to play music on, don't they? Uh, phones do everything these days. They don't need anything else. But even if it's the kid with those, still, you know, if you're the parent, say, okay, we're going we're gonna to put everything away tonight, you know, because I want to communicate with you because you're special to me. So provoking would be, one way to avoid provoking would be to avoid not making time to talk to our young people. Again, I'm going to talk about two or three of these, about three of these, then I'll pause and see what comments you have. Let's do it that way. Okay, insufficient praise. Not talking, uh, not bringing up the good things that are, that are in our child's life, the things that they do. It's very easy to correct our child most, time, most of the time, unless we have a parent who's just not paying any attention whatsoever. There's plenty of occasions upon which you point out well, you're doing something wrong. Don't do that. No, or whatever. And again, we have to make a conscious effort to look for times for praise because the insufficient praise is something that's likely to provoke. And genuine praise, not artificial, because our kids are often smarter than we think they are. And if we stick with artificial praise, it's not going to be very helpful. Uh, one of the places I read describes it as specific and targeted. You think about exactly what it is that, that they've done well, that, that you're proud of them for. It's something that you recognize and they recognize, and then you praise them for it. But insufficient praise, and especially combined with a great deal of fault-finding, is something that's likely to cause provoke, being provoked. I thank my God always concerning you. That's what Paul told the Corinthians. I thank my God always. Then what did he write to the Corinthians about? What's the gist of Paul writing to 1 Corinthians? Begins with a P. 
problems, right? And then he goes right down there. The ones that he heard from somebody else and the ones that he heard from the, you know, the household of Chloe and the ones maybe they wrote him about, whatever. It's just problem after problem. The church at Corinth had a lot of problems. What does Paul say as he begins it? I thank God for you all the time. I'm constantly you know, praying to God and th- being thankful for you because there are bound to be a lot of good things about the Christians at Corinth. So uh, some praise goes a long way. And insufficient praise is very likely to result in provocation. Okay, not keeping promises. We've talked under some other categories about mom and dad and uh, the impression that they leave on their children about what parenting is all about. And in several of these, I think that's important that we remember. What we're doing, if we remember this, this is probably good for us in every one of these categories, if we will remember that what we're doing is we're showing them, we're suggesting to them, here's how a Christian mom and here's how a Christian dad behave. That's what we're telling them. We don't have to ever use those words. We may not consciously realize that. It's better if we do. But that's what we're doing. We're telling them by our life in front of them, our modeling, this is, this is what parenting is like. This is the kind of parenting that God wants to be. And of course, if there's a great divide between what they're seeing and what they come to know from God's word, or what they come to know from some other situation, then there's going to be problems. Well, not keeping promises is one of those things. If we do not keep promises to our children, then they will grow up, and what we taught them is, it's not important that you keep promises. Jesus said, let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever more than thee, whatever is more than these is from the evil one. And of course, his uh, context right there was not simply, or certainly not about child raising, but his principle was still very true and very valid. The folks back then, they liked to make some promises, some pledges, some oaths. And if it was according to the right thing, like, you know, today people lay their hand on the Bible. Back then they differentiated between the temple and the gold on the temple. Or the altar and the sacrifice on the altar. They had all sorts of of, uh, uh, escape clauses when when they pledged something, when they made a promise. And Caesar said... Yes is yes, and no is no. If you start doing anything else, well, that comes from the devil, the evil one. So in speaking with our children, keeping promises is important because they're learning how dependable a parent is supposed to be or perhaps not dependable. Another passage here. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. That would be a basic thing I would suggest that we'll be teaching our children. That when you become a Christian, as they get older and old enough to realize and think about that, that uh, transition in their life, when you become a Christian, you know, you, you've got to put away lying. You're not a child anymore. You, you know, you don't, you don't give an answer that, uh, you know, makes the situation sound a little better to mom and dad. Christians put away lying. Well, mom and dad have got to be sure that they're speaking truthfully too because a young man or a young woman, the, the children, will possibly think one of two things. Number one, that uh, being a parent involves being undependable. And that's okay because mom and dad were undependable. Or it may lead them to conclude that it's okay to be deceitful. That mom and dad aren't doing this out of weakness. They're just saying whatever it takes to get by. They'll promise me whatever as long as they get the behavior out of me that they want. They'll promise me whatever it is. And they don't think much about it. And they don't worry too much about keeping their word. So the observations could tell them that mom and dad are not dependable or that mom and dad are deceitful. But not keeping the promises that we make, that's... uh, a possibility to provoke unto wrath that most powerful and often dangerous, passionate emotion that people have. Okay, that's three. Stop and see if we have some um, comments here.
They don't let me down. We've had two weeks in a row of good comments. Okay, we'll go on and do a couple more. I know. Oh, okay. I have to tell you one more time. Yeah. And then they tell them that how many more times? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we all, you know, if you're not aware of that, just take a trip down to Walmart or Meyer or anywhere and go, you know, walk around a little while. And you'll see that. You'll see a case of that. I'll guarantee it. Unless it's, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, nobody's there. You'll see some mama. If you don't stop that, if I have to tell you one more time, I'm going to do this. And it never gets done. You can follow them around the store, watch it happen. And they don't do anything. And as Miss Andy said, you know, you're teaching them that you could, you know, say something that's not truthful. You know, Mom always did that. Dad did that. Made all kinds of, you know, threats about what was going to happen, but uh, never did anything. It's terrible on discipline. It's terrible on what we're teaching a young person when we do that as well as not correcting whatever needs to be corrected that might have, been, might have been significant. Sometimes I wonder about how significant things are when I see these things out in the public. It's like, couldn't you, couldn't you just wait and talk about that when you got home? Maybe you would have been better off. We have a young opinion there already. Okay, anybody else? All right, public chastening. Public chastening. <clears throat> Would we be willing to give our children the same respect that the Lord tells us to give a brother or sister in Christ? When do we ever, when does Jesus ever tell us to chastise a brother or sister in Christ? After everything else has been done and you just have to take it before the church. But there's all kinds of solutions before that. Would not we want to pay our children the same respect that we would do a brother, sister in Christ? More if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And that's the gist of Jesus' teachings. It don't make it any more public than it has to become. Later, you may have to take some witnesses. And then eventually, it may have to be known by the church. But when we're talking about our children, public chastening can be a source of the provocation of anger because it just, it's just so much better talked about in private. Now, exception here, what do you do if your child is misbehaving in private and... Uh, Maybe in front of his peers, old enough to know better. We're not talking about a three-year-old, four-year-old taking something off the shelf at the store. But a child that's old enough and is obviously refusing your authority, your attempts to teach them what is right and lead them in that way, and just because some of their peers happen to be around, what do you do?
Now, I know you thought about that before. Aren't there sometimes when you have to be involved and it has to be publicly? You, you can't wait. You can't wait. It has to be done right then. You may need to teach your young person the lesson that you do not ignore me just because your peers are around. You may be teaching a lesson also to his or her peers at the same time as they understand and maybe they think, well, I wish my mom and dad held me to some kind of rules, some kind of principles of right and wrong. And you know, maybe they need to hear it. But whenever possible, whenever there's a private thing, just like Jesus taught us with a, with a brother or sister, you talk to them in private. You work it out that way. And... We, we take our child in the, uh, the quiet of our uh, living room or kitchen or wherever it might be, and there we talk about the things whenever possible, and certainly when they're private matters. Because uh, what, what group of people become to a young person even more important than mom and dad's opinion somewhere along the way, usually? peers and it is so damaging if we were to unfairly chastise our young person in front of the people that he really wants the respect of now that doesn't mean he or she really needs the respect of those peers but we all know that's part of it don't we we all know that's part of growing up and we're going to look at our peers and we're going to say you know I want their acceptance And to take a case that doesn't need to be discussed publicly and just maybe, maybe use the fact that those peers are there to, to make it hurt a little bit more is going to be counterproductive. And I would say in most cases would be something we could avoid. Of course, somewhere along the way, we've also got to help that young person to understand that... Uh, the peers are in the same position that he or she is in, right? That they're still learning too. They're learning about right and wrong. They're learning about making decisions. So we have to somehow balance that so that we don't have, <clears throat> by the time they get to be a certain age as a teenager, uh, mom and dad's guidance means basically nothing, but the people that I run with it means everything. But anyway, I've started preaching already. Public chastening. Most of the time, we just don't want to do it. Might be a case where it's appropriate, but most of the time, uh, handle things in private. And again, you know, walking through Walmart or wherever, have we ever seen that principle violated in a powerful way? Sure we have. Things that really, you know, it did not need to be known. Just like standing behind somebody in line with a cell phone and you, they're arguing with somebody, a spouse or whoever, a boss or whatever they're arguing with, you know. We, other people don't need to hear all that. Well, our, uh, our children uh, don't need their peers hearing everything that we say to them as they say to us. For another reason that I just happen to think of, it's going to influence how they talk to us, isn't it? Don't, doesn't a young person have at least the tendency to become defensive if his peers are hearing him or her being corrected? When, when are they more likely to talk back? You know, when you're talking calmly to them at home or if you have just given them a real harsh correction right in front of these people that are really close to them. That's what peers are most of the time. When are they going to be defensive? They're likely to be defensive because their friends have just heard some things from mom or dad that uh, they didn't want them to hear. Okay, one more. We'll stop for more questions. Not enough freedom. 
We all, I think, have probably heard the phrase helicopter mom or helicopter dad or helicopter pa parents. Whereas we need to spend a great deal of time with our children, there's also a point at which we need to give them some space to be faced with decision making on their own. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter to the joy of your Lord. You remember the context for that? You use those talents well. What happens? Hey, here's some more. Now, what do we want to happen with the young people that uh, we've been given charge over? What do we want to see? We want to see them faced with situations in which they can make their own decisions. We want to see them given one talent, two talents, five talents, whatever it is. Opportunities to use their abilities, their decision-making uh, ability, and make good decisions. And then when they do, we can give them some more and some more, and some more. And that's what happens from the time they're old enough to understand and make some decisions, wherever that happens, all the way up until the time that they're ready to walk out that door and go face some, uh, most situations on their own. They may call home once in a while, but it's going to be their decision-making process. And so if we don't give them any freedom... Let's, say, let's take a, a weird, impossible, I hope, situation. We don't give them any freedom until they're 18. They would say, okay, strike a trot. What kind of decisions are they going to make? Not enough freedom. The uh, servants, they got talents. They used them well. They got more. The one that didn't use his well was penalized for that. But what we're talking about is, is having children to uh, to take on responsibilities, to fulfill those, to make good decisions, to earn trust. And when an opportunity comes their way, to fulfill that opportunity well. And then mom and dad will say, you can have a little more freedom because you have earned my trust. You know, you can stay out 30 minutes later than I said you could before. Or you, you can drive the car in this situation that I wasn't allowing before, or, or you know, whatever the situation is based on their age and their abilities. But <clears throat> if there's not enough freedom, if that child perceives that uh, mom and dad are not going to let them grow up, not going to let them learn to make their own decisions and occasionally their own mistakes, then that can be a source in which anger is provoked. Now, I said I was going to stop for questions, but I'm not. I'm going to get one more thing here. Too much freedom, okay? The opposite of that. Giving someone so much freedom that uh, mom and dad are basically not involved. No discipline equals no love. That's what the wise man said. If you, if you love your son or daughter, you'll do something about it. You'll try to correct them, whatever ways are appropriate. Too much freedom, there's no correction. And somewhere along the way, the child realizes that. That's what I meant about the peers. You know, doing something in front of, of, of your son or daughter's peers. They may look at that and say... You know, mom and dad don't care what I do. And somewhere along the way they come to realize that's not a great thing. That's a terrible thing. That doesn't show a lot of concern for me. Galatians 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Okay, now Paul's talking about the old law and the new law and all those problems the Galatians were having with trying to bring things over from the law of Moses. 
But he makes a valid example here. Because this, this guy, this, this boy, this little boy, young boy, not capable of making decisions. Now someday he's going to take over the household. You know, his father may have a huge household and hundreds of acres of land and dozens of servants. and Someday he's going to be in charge of all that. But who takes him to school? The school bus driver, some translations say. The tutor, some translations say. The most trusted servant takes him to school. Now, what if he says, I don't want to go to school? Does that, does that most trusted servant have the right to say, yes, you are, your daddy wants it? Does he have a right to say that? Yes. It didn't matter that he was going to, be, he was going to take over everything when he became mature. He wasn't mature yet. Same with the king's son. You know, someday the prince is going to be the king. He's going to take over. But he's too young to make those decisions now. He needs guidance. And that's why the king is given a servant, his most trusted servant, to say, you see that my son does certain things. And he answers to the king, if he doesn't do those things, he'd be in trouble. Because that child, he's not ready to take over everything yet. He's got a lot of things to learn. You can't give him too much freedom. There have to be limits. So, not enough freedom, too much freedom. Both of those can result in situations in which anger is provoked. Okay, now I'm going to keep my promise. I'm going to stop and see if you've got comments or questions. Hopefully comments. You guys haven't had too much eggnog already, have you? You're too quiet tonight. <laughs> well, I have no choice but to go on then. We, we might get through with these tonight. Yes, sir. I'm an old man. I raised my children. And looking at the screen, I can see where I made a lot of mistakes. I wish I could do it over again. I think most of us feel that way to some extent. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how much grandparents know but the parents won't listen? Anybody experienced that? Yeah, grandparents have learned a lot that parents can learn from. And we all think about situations and as I go through these, these things here, I think situations that I think I could handle that better. You know, out of both boys and how they turned out but I look back and I could have handled some things better and I wish that uh, I'd been sitting in a class and hearing all of this uh, when I was 21 or 20 or whatever Almost two generations there. Yeah, we're not, but yeah. And we older children maintain that the younger ones got much better parents than we did. Because by the time they got the first three, the first three, they made enough mistakes to figure out what to do with the next three. Mm hmm. So you gave your parents on-the-job training, yeah. and it worked out as a blessing for the next three. Yeah. yeah. And how many times does the younger one or the younger one say, uh, or, or the older one say, they were a lot harder on me than they were on you? <laughs> Has anybody ever heard the opposite? I don't think I've ever heard the opposite. I mean, even if there's two in a family, you know, the older one will say, man, they didn't let me get away with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
A little bit of freedom at a time. Yeah. Well, I'm all with you because I have my little brother's nine years younger. He definitely got easier than I did. No doubt about it. Okay, let's try to cover one more here. Unless, unless we've got comments. I don't want to cut off the discussion. Yes, Ed? Yeah. couldn't hear all that peers in school powerful influence on our young people that's why we've got to make this time somehow we've got to find this time to explain to them that when you get out there there are going to be people telling you a different world view they're going to be telling you that man came from a, a primordial soup you know billions of years ago well not billions but anyway a long time ago they'll say and uh and they're going to be telling you that you can live any way you want to. They're going to be telling you that what I'm going to tell you later on is not valid. That I don't know what I'm talking about. You see, we start these things early. We start these discussions when they're young. We prepare them for the fact that the world is not going to agree with us who are Christian parents. Their peers probably aren't unless they get, are very, very fortunate in the peers they're able to choose. And the schools are not because they're going to have teachers who don't believe in God, perhaps. And all these situations work, working against us. That's why it's so important that we start early, we make time, and we tell them these things ahead of time. We prepare them for what they're going to face. And then when they hear that first time and somebody says, oh, yeah, yeah, Mom and Dad said you'd say that. But, uh, you know, I've studied the Bible all my life. I've been to Sunday school, and I know what it says. We prepare them for that. But good comment. Thank you. Anybody else? Because we probably don't have very long left. Well, it should ring at any time according to the official time here. Thank you for your comments. Once again, very good. We'll finish this up next week, Lord willing. And remember, we've got another quarter of Bible class to talk about those things still that you asked for when we started this and we've not yet gotten to, but we will. <laughs>